joining me. Is this working okay? You can hear me? Okay, awesome. Thank you for joining us today uh, for another Lunch and Learn. So welcome to those of you that this is your first time. Um, if you are returning, welcome back. Uh, we have a great presentation lined up for you today from Ryan Urich. Um, so I, I will uh, go ahead and introduce him very quickly. If you'd like to come up here, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we do have a sponsor uh, that is Blink Lending. They're not with us today, but if you are familiar with them, they are a lender. Uh, feel free to give them a quick Google. Great company to work with. Yours. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Do you have the clickers? Okay. There you go. Can everyone hear me? How's everyone doing? Great. All right. Good. Good. So um, today we're really just talking um, more of an educational uh, presentation on you know why alternative investments and specifically uh, private real estate. Um, wouldn't be a good presentation without a little legal disclaimer, but. Um, Everything I'm telling you is from my personal views, my personal experience it is not advice. Talk to your tax and advisors and, and whatnot. So blah, 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 right? Um, so a little bit background on me. I've been in financial services the last 23 years. Uh, I was a banker for about eight years. And the last 15, 16 years have been private equity real estate. Um, before founding Rycor Capital, I, I was a senior executive with uh, a top three bank investing uh, high net worth capital into commercial real estate. Um, in 2019, I formed Rycor Capital, and I've since grown that company to about $350 million of assets. Office, industrial, retail, we're in 10 states. Uh, we manage about 2.2 million square feet, uh, about $125 million of equity uh, from investors. Um, so, so this is what I live and breathe every day uh, on, on, on commercial real estate. So Really what we're going to do today is, is just high level talk about, okay, why does real estate make sense in your portfolio? And then once you've decided to actually invest in commercial real estate, um, ways to invest in it and just some things that, that I recommend you consider when evaluating different real estate uh, investments. So if you, if you look at uh, your typical investment portfolio, you know, the, the objective typically is diversification. Um, and diversification in the sense of you want to spread out your investable assets across many asset classes. Uh, reason behind that, you don't want all your eggs in one basket because if you're in Apple and they go down, then you know you, you typically um, are exposed. So really the definition of diversification is the practice of spreading out your investable assets across multiple asset classes. So once you get to that point, you 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 the question typically is, okay, well, how do I allocate it? So there's you know, what you really want to look at is correlation between different asset classes. So if if correlation is one, when asset class one goes up, asset class B goes up perfectly, right? So you want something that is more neg negatively correlated. So for instance, um, real estate is typically uh, negatively correlated to public equity. So when public equities go down, real estate goes up. So that's what you're trying to do is to diversify your risk um, across these different asset classes. So again, the, the less, a, the, the less correlation, the better. Um, so why real estate? Real estate has, has been a great in inflation head hedge, as well as a diversification tool, as you can see. So what this chart is saying, it's basically the correlation. The blue line is the correlation between the S and P 500 and direct real estate. So you can see that the correlation is negative, which is good. Because when stocks go down, real estate goes up. When stocks go up, it goes down uh, a, a smaller piece. Um, now, you, the, the black line is, is REITs. And so we'll get into you know, re, the difference between direct real estate and, and REITs. But you can see it's, it's more positively correlated. Yeah. No, it's not. But it's never, it's never up to one or, or 0.8. Um, it's always it's always less than one. Um, and so, you know, a, a read, a real estate investment trust is a publicly traded company. So it has a lot more volatility um, and, and it, it is really acts like a like a stock. Um, so this is this is an interesting chart. And in, in, in really so the old the old school thought was 60, 40, 60 in equities, 40 in, in fixed income. Right. That was that was the way as you got older and you got to retirement, you flip that. And now you're putting money into fixed income because you have left less time to uh, recoup any losses. And so what this chart is really showing is when you add alternatives to it, 
um, your risk actually goes down um, and your returns can go up. Um, so for instance, the 60, 40, um, I can't even see that. Uh, the 60, 40 equity and fixed income, you can see volatility, that's your risk. So that's nine, uh, you know, 9.6% risk and with an overall return of, you know, 8.3. You can see if you add 30% of alternatives, your risk goes down pretty substantially um, and your return goes up. So again, it's a diversification tool that reduces your risk and has the, the, the possibility of increasing returns. Um, All right, so this is a pretty colorful um, chart, but really all this is, is saying the last 10 years, alternative asset class returns. Just to show you, alternative investments have performed fairly well the last 10 years, um, and on average um, have done quite, quite better than the S&P 500 and, and public equities. Again, just the case for why alternatives make sense in, in direct real estate. Um, back to real estate, why, why it makes sense. Um, even in today's environment, very strong fundamentals. Vacancies are at all-time lows. Um, you're still getting a risk premium to 10-year um, treasuries, which is that's how real estate trades. Um, so, for instance, if treasuries today are about 3.5%, you're still getting a 3% a, a premium um, on top of that for your, for your risk. Um, and then the inflation hedge, that, that's the big piece of real estate. Everyone says, you know, real estate's inflation hedge. And the reason being is as prices go up, your rents go up, right? So it's important to, um, that's why a lot of focus has been on getting into direct, direct real estate that have shorter term leases where you're able to reprice those leases. Um, you can see in, the, in the, the graph, so we're in the blue, we're in the high, high inflation, and falling and you can see over the last, since 1978 on average um it returns have been about 11 percent yeah so high inflation which we're in today but it's slowly coming down right because of what the fed's doing um and so that's why we would be in that environment now last year we were at high and rising right it was it was it was going up and up and up um so you can see it's it's just it's a great inflation inflation hedge um, uh, in the current environment. Okay, so now now we've all decided real estate's great. Everyone wants to invest in it, and now how do I invest in it? Right, that's the big question. So I've kind of laid there. There's there's definitely more ways, but these are the three main uh, structures that most people will invest in. So number one is REITs. Um, so that's a real estate investment trust. It's a regulated, uh, <coughs> product. Um, it's, it's traded on the stock exchange. Most of them are, some are untraded, but it really works like a, like a stock, right? And it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the correlation. Um, you know, the yields on it are fairly low, you know, they're in the four to 5% range, um, which in today's environment doesn't make a lot of sense when treasuries are at three or 4%. Right. So that's why I don't know if, if you've seen in the news, there has been a run on the REITs where people are, are, are liquidating out of them just because it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to take take the risk. Um, but there's definitely pros to it. It's regulated. It offers liquidity. There's a secondary market. You own a, a, a REIT share. You can sell it the next day. Um, it definitely has diversification benefits, uh, passive income. Um, you know, relying on a, a corporate team to, to kind of manage those investments. Um, the cons really are, uh, you know, low yield, reliance on management. Um, there are there are some front end load fees and, and, and you don't get the tax benefits that you do with direct real estate. So these next two are what my, me and my firm do on a regular basis. Um, there's really two ways to do it. It's a single asset syndication, which really all that is saying is, um, you find an asset, you put it together a partnership, you have investors come in and they own that asset um, with you. <clears throat> and so, you know, the, the, the benefits to that are the tax benefits. You get to depreciate that asset. You get to write off the uh, interest on your loans. Um, so you're, you're able to shelter some of that operating income uh, from taxes. Um, also, when you sell the asset, it's a capital gain, so it's it's taxed at a lower tax rate than um, ordinary income. Um, typically, you have higher yields. There is higher risk, 
but um, better a better income vehicle than uh, than a REIT. Um, now the 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 risks of these are all your money's in one asset. So you get you give me a hundred thousand dollars, it all goes into an office building. So if that office building doesn't perform, you lose all your money. So you so so you don't have the diversification benefits you do like you have a REIT that has multiple assets. I mean that ideally, my opinion is you you want to invest that your money spread out amongst um, many properties. Um, there's fees related, you know, the managers that, that offer these, you know, charge acquisition fees and disposition fees. There's usually a profit sharing piece. Um, and, and again, the, the manager is motivated by like, pushing profits. Uh, and then the third one is really very similar to the single asset syndication. It's just a larger pool of money. So a commingled real estate investment fund. So they're, that's when a, a sponsor raises, you know, hundred million plus they go get debt on it they can buy 300 million dollars worth of real estate um and and that's the vehicle where you can build diversification right because you can buy 10 or 15 properties allocate all across the country um and and still gives you the, the same benefits as a single asset uh, syndication um, tax benefits um, um the, the the downside is your money is locked up there's no liquidity so when you invest in these type of vehicles, your money's locked up for five to seven years. So if you're saving for Johnny to go to, to college in the next three years, you probably don't want to, you know, put, put your money in, in something like this. Um, and, um, you know, obviously the same, same type of fees as, as, as the other syndication. So those are the three main ways, um, you, you know, investing in commercial real estate. Um, and so lastly, it's really just some things to consider um, as far as when you're evaluating these real estate opportunities, you know, what, what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> first is like, what's the objective of the real estate? That's what I always tell people. Like, don't just invest in real estate to invest in it. What's the objective? Why, why are you doing it? Um, a lot of times it's for diversification, but also it's for income, right? Maybe you're replacing fixed income bonds with real estate because bonds aren't, aren't producing that well. But at the end of the day, when you're investing that money, you, you really need to have an objective, like a criteria and look at why am I investing in this real estate? There needs to be a reason. Um, next thing is how much risk you want to take. I mean, there's, there's different spectrum of risk across real estate. There's development, which would be the highest. Um, there's buying a Walgreens, which would be the lowest. Um, do you want to be in the middle? Do you want, in, are you, are you more focused on income? Do you want income and growth? Um, you know, cause real estate can be more of a hybrid, hybrid product in the sense of the rents pay you cash flow, And then when you sell it, you're getting appreciation, which is more of an equity piece. So, so folks that want a little bit of both, maybe a core plus risk strategy, something that's 80, 85% occupied. There's a little upside, but lower risk. Um, and then, you know, next, if it, it, who the sponsor is, is, is a huge piece, you know, so whoever's pitching you a deal, I think the, the main thing you want to dive in is, you know, what's their track record? Have they done this before? Um, I always like asking, okay, what was your worst investment? Like, tell me, tell me what happened and how bad did it get? You know, um, you know, is it, I, I lost someone's, uh, all their money or is it well it wasn't a good deal everyone got their money back but they got five percent i mean that's the scenario on a worst case because you know all these deals will act differently so that so that's one thing to, to, to keep in mind i um i truly believe you want to have a well capitalized manager so when when times get tough he's not doing capital calls right he is actually you know investing his own money into those deals to kind of right size them and whatnot so so really focus in on who that manager is how long they've been around do they have uh, capital behind them and can they weather any any storm because real estate is cyclical um and then and then lastly we get this a lot like who, who's investing with that that manager you know we have you know, primarily family office money, high net worth money, um, and some institutional money. Um, so what that does is just brings credibility. Um, you know, if, if um, you know, a famous investor or whatever is invested with you, that kind of, you know, shows the other investors, hey, this, you know, the, the, that manager has, has kind of been qualified. Um, and then, um, 
you know, this is more of the financial analysis. If you want, really want to get in the weeds on the underwriting piece, you really got to, you know, dissect what that manager is giving you. Um, like, for instance, in multifamily, you typically will see very high rent growth and low cap rates. Um, my opinion is life doesn't work that way. Um, rent doesn't go up 8% every year for 10 years. It, it, it you know, it doesn't. So, so you just got to kind of, um, when you're evaluating these, understand how they're getting to their numbers, um, is, is, is a key, uh, uh, piece, piece of, of evaluating these. Um, the next piece is the debt. The debt is a huge piece. All these assets are usually financed, I'd say 50 to 70%. So understanding fixed rate floating rate, especially in this environment, um, you know, we fixed, we actually fixed our entire portfolio, um, in 2021 at three and three and a half percent. So we're doing okay in this environment. We don't float. So, so that's a key important uh, um, component is interest rate risk, right? Especially in this environment. The next thing is, do they actually have the debt? Right? So, because it's one thing to assume something, but to actually have it committed is, is another that plays into this. Because if he's pitching you, hey, I've got 4% debt, and then now now he comes back and it's 8%, well, the deal's kind of upside down at that point. So um, it's something to consider. Um, you know, looking at lease rates, are leases below market? Or are they above market? You know, you want, you typically want a building that's below market so that you can reprice and organically grow your income. Um, if they're if they're above market, there's risk that when those leases mature, you're going to have to reduce the rate. So um, just something to keep in mind. And then are expenses in line with other properties? I mean, that's a big piece of our business um, because if you think about a tenant in an office building, for instance, they're going to go see three or four offices, and they're going to compare the price, you know, the base rent plus whatever whatever expenses they have to pay. So if your expenses are are higher than everybody else, you're going to have to charge a, a, a lower base rent. So you really want to hone in and, and we're, we're a hands-on operator and, and really focus in on a lot of um, expenses and, and, and how they um, kind of uh, compare to um, com our competitors. And then lastly, it was really um, what's the investment structure and fees? Um, how's the investment structured and what rights you know, do you have typically if you're just a fractional owner in a, in a property, you really don't have too much control, right? You're relying on the manager to make all the decisions. Um, typically if you are an anchor investor, which usually means, you know, I'm raising 8 million, you put up five, you put up a substantial piece. They typically will have some, some control rights, but for the most part, the manager is running the show and, and, um, making all the decisions. Um, then secondly is fees and, you know, we have, you know, there's, there's a different uh, school of thought on the fees. To me, I think fees are important because you want a profitable operator. You do not want an operator that is not profitable. So, you know, typical fees are acquisition fees, disposition fees, you know, carried interest, which is a um, profit sharing piece. Um, you know, being a manager, that's how we, that's how our business makes revenue is, is, is through those fees. But I, I do think, and you know, we've come across investors who say, you don't want to pay any fees, but you know, they want to keep the lights on. So how, how, how do you kind of do that? Um, you know, we have a 10 person staff and, you know, we gotta, we gotta do that. So, um, you know, I think fees are important, making sure they're market, making sure it's not, you know, they're not making too much money on the front end and they're, they're making a decent management fee up, I think is very important. Um, so an acquisition fee is probably one to 2%. Um, a, the carried interest piece is, is usually 20 to 25% of, of the profits after a hurdle. Um, and that, that, that's the next kind of point I wanted to make is it's important when you structure these investments, there are protections for the investor in the sense of hurdle rates. And what I mean by hurdle rates is, so, so typically what we do is we say, you get your money back, plus you get eight to 10% per year on your money. And then if anything's left over, then we can split some profits. What you wouldn't want is something that was like pro rata, like everyone participated regardless of what the investors got. Um, so that's very important. Um, I mean, and there's, there's, you can get as sophisticated as you want, or you can just have, Hey, I got to make eight, 10% per year. And then we split there's IRR hurdles. There, there's all sorts of ways to do it, but that's something to hone in on is 
how are you protected from the manager making bad decisions? So, um, and then lastly, I think I kind of touched on this is just, you know, these are illiquid investments except for a REIT. So you are, um, kind of locked into that. So you really have to determine, um, you know, how long do you want to be in this investment? What kind of whole period is, is the investment? And, um, um, that does it make sense in your portfolio. So, um, Yeah, let's let's actually I got through that pretty quick. So <laughs> let's let's go to questions. You know, when we are talking about getting into these investments, just like stocks, it is cyclical because I observed that just before COVID or beginning of the COVID, people who got into the passive investments uh, as a passive investors in these areas hmm. benefited tremendously. Yes. Today. So uh, it is cyclical. And to that extent, there is a risk involved. I mean, I, I'm not saying downside of the risk, like you will go flat, like to, uh, right. if stock market tanks, right. this doesn't, but still in terms of returns, don't you think so? Um, so COVID, yes, that was a great, actually, we were a big buyer during COVID, did yes. exceptionally well. Um, if you're a seller in today's market, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. But a buyer, because there's going to be distress, it's not going to be 2008 again, but it's going to be what, what you're seeing is everyone whose loans coming due, well, they had three, four percent. Now it's eight percent. So how do you refi that? Their values are going down. So, and that's why we're we're out buying property is because we're getting exceptional pricing on it. So when you say cyclical, yes, it's just when are you a buyer, when are you a seller. You know, um, if you're a seller right now, it, yeah, it, it could be tough. I think if you're a buyer, that's where there a ton of right. opportunity. As a passive investor, that's the yeah. question I have. Yeah. Is the timing right? Yeah, um, I believe it is. I believe yeah. it will be one of the best buying opportunities since 2008. Okay. Great. You said something that um, yeah, services make sense, right? I mean, you mentioned you're out there buying properties because the folks are getting ready to refinance and the interest rates go from, I don't know, whatever, three, four, right. two, eight. Right. But at the same token, even if you get a discounted price, also paying a higher interest regardless. So so how do you how do you leverage yeah. you know on your end uh -huh. what's re, what's a real good price versus your interest that you're paying? Well um that's exactly correct. The average Joe is getting eight percent. Um you know that's why if you work with a firm like mine who has scale, we have negotiating power. Um, I can tell you we're working on a deal right now we're getting a class A asset at a nine cap and we're getting fixed rate debt at six. So the returns are phenomenal. Um, exactly. Right. So it's a lot of relationship based. If you have relationships, there are banks out there that will give you attractive terms. Um, but if you're just a one off, you know, hey, I've got a million dollars, I'm gonna go buy something, you know, you're right, it, it would be a lot more difficult. So, so if you are going to invest in, you know, a third party, like manage, you know, you want, want someone who has that, that buying power, that, 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 someone that, that uh, leverage. So do you want Mike in here? Cause if you're asking a question, can you have to answer your question? Oh. What is the best return you have produced in all these years uh, for a yearly return? And what's the worst return that you produce? <laughs> You're using my words against me, huh? Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, we've been fortunate that, you know, our our current portfolio um, it currently pays out about 8.6% per year. And that's a, you know, 20, 20 property portfolio. Um, we're actually in the process of selling some of our industrial and it's, it's coming in about 30% IRRs, which is annual compounded. So we're, we're, I'm a cash flow investor, so we don't do development. We don't do distress. We, we do deals that cash flow day one, because again, I represent family, family money and high net worth money. And that's most important. So, so all of our deals generate cash flow. Now the riskier deals maybe are five or 6%. And then as you do your value add, you increase it. Um, as far as my worst deal, I've never lost anyone's money. Um, and I've probably, probably our worst deal has probably been like a, probably an 8%. Uh, 
not not too bad all in um knock on wood so um but that just goes to the experience i've been doing this for you know two decades and and just and that that's a key component to if you're investing uh with a manager is just who's the team you know what's their experience you know i did it for an institution so obviously i my training is is more institutional um so yeah that's three to five years three to five years um is is our typical hold but again because it's cyclical depends on where the market like right now i wouldn't want to sell anything <laughs> right yeah yeah right right so any other questions so in terms So in terms of your uh, kind of your um, minimum investments, can you talk about, you know, that? Because obviously that plays into what people can and cannot do. Right. Individuals trying right. to look at your firm as a potential, you know, uh, ways to invest. Yeah. So, I mean, we've typically done $100,000 minimums. Um, and, you know, so we have we but we do we have some folks who have done 50 to 100 and then we have a bunch of go folks in the 500 million type range. Um, you know, when I started the business, I did want to, you know, open it up to, you know, more investors and not just, I've kind of stayed away from the institutional capital. I, now we've done a couple deals with them. Um, but, but, uh, for the most part, it's, you know, 50 to a hundred thousand in a deal. Um, and we're currently raising a hundred million dollar fund right now, uh, that, that, that that's open for investment. Do you, do you look at uh, kind of world events like uh, debasement of currency, perhaps um, caused by lack of uh, or loss of our reserve currency, world reserve currency, uh, you know, the petrodollar or the Ukraine war firing up even more than it's fired up, uh, change in presidency? I was just wondering, you know, what global events, how does that affect your uh, investment strategy for the next say five or 10 years yeah it, it definitely does i mean i will say the political piece of it plays into it um now not so much in texas but you know when you and, and this goes into why we invest in this in the south is because it's more business friendly um but yeah definitely i mean what's going on right now with inflation and the government pumping all this money into the economy i mean it's 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 a tough thing and this in the supply chain that's a huge thing so expenses even in commercial real estate have gone up i mean janitorial has gone up property taxes are going up um it, it's it's so it's hitting it's hitting everyone really hard which is i mean we we have just we dissect you know we're private equity guys so we're di we dissect those expenses and, and try to cut them at, at any way but yeah the ukraine war i mean the price of oil especially being in in um in Houston, we have an energy corridor building that's obviously, you know, pr pretty tied to oil. So, so yeah, I mean, I think you, you know, at the end of the day, yes, you're, I'm an investment manager, but, the, but I'm also just an investor and you really have to understand, okay, what's going to happen in the next five years. It's great when you buy the deal today, but what's going to happen in five years. And so I, I do think that plays into the decision-making process. You mentioned one diversification. One second. The microphone isn't making a whole lot of difference. You mentioned, sir, you mentioned about the diversification uh, uh, as far as investment goes. So, are there any favorites uh, of yours when it comes to the st uh, states in uh, US? Like, a uh, few states are, you know, that you prefer or your company likes in, in terms of investing? Yes. Okay. We'd um, like to know. Thank you. And I might be biased. I'm born and raised Houstonian, but Texas is the best place right now. Just because think about the migration of people coming here. Everyone's leaving California. Uh, they're coming here just because the, the cost of living is better. Um, the, everyone wants to do business here. So, so Texas, so Houston, Dallas, San Antonio are our three key markets. Austin, it's just a little pricey right now. Um, so, so those, and then um, the Sun Belt. So Florida, another great place to do business. Um, also think about state income tax. Texas doesn't have state income tax. 
Florida doesn't. Um, we like Georgia. Atlanta's great. North Carolina. Um, so really, if you if you were to just do the Sun Belt states, and and if you were to dissect, and we're we're a very data driven company. Um, we have all this analytics behind it. You can see the migration of people coming from you know the Midwest and the in the East Coast. Um, in West Coast uh, to those states. And that's re if real estate is about demographics, okay? It's a demographics game. Where are people going? What's the demand? Do they want to be in an office? Do they want to do e-commerce? I mean, th those are the key components. But but the Sun Belt states are the ones that I focus on. I uh, previously left my employer, and I'm planning to roll over my 401k. Um, how does that all work? Um, actually the, the quest people would be the best people to talk about that. Okay. Anyone from, but, but you can do something like that. Yeah. So it's a possibility for you to do it. You would be a custodian and play like quest trust company to be that kind of middle person, the oversight responsibility. Uh -huh. uh, but we would assist you with the account opening, the movement of funds. And ultimately we just need to see the investment documents vested in the IRA's name instead of your own. Uh, we'll sign off and send the funds out. Thank you. Of course. Anything else? All right. Yeah, I have oh. a question. Yeah. Can I sell my asset and do a 1031 exchange it into your interest? Um, into RR? No. So the 1031, the, these type of vehicles aren't eligible for a 1031. You'd have to have a Del Delaware Statutory Trust to do that. Um, so unfortunately, no, that typically can't take 1031 funds. Um, so it's, it's a great tax benefit. The, the question was, what's a 1031? So it's a great tax benefit that the IRS has, has given. Basically what it's saying is if you own a piece of investment property, it can't be your personal property, it can't be your second home, it can't be your beach house. It needs to be an investment property. But if you sell your property for 5 million, as long as you go buy another property, investment property for the same value, your your capital gain tax is deferred. It doesn't go away. It's just deferred. So that's what a lot of people do. They'll buy a piece of real estate, make a little money, flip it into something bigger, 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 bigger. And then eventually, you know, eventually you got to pay the piper, right? I mean, eventually you got to sell, sell the asset and pay, pay your taxes. But there, it is a great vehicle for... Um, you know, passing on an inheritance because because when you die, there's a step up in basis and there's a bunch of tax tax things. But that's what a 1031 is. It allows a real estate investor to defer those capital gains if they reinvest it. Yeah. One more question. Is Rikor Capital uh, mainly into, as you said, you guys are not into distress uh, properties or anything, right? You are into commercial properties, industri industrial properties. Are you into... Um, acquiring uh, lands, then you may, you know, when you said that Texas is your favorite, there is unlimited land, mm -hmm. even now, yeah. you know, and Louisiana. So, what is your stake there? Yeah, I mean, our focus has been cash flowing assets, what we call value add. So, that, so right. it's, it's, it's buildings that are just mismanaged and okay. maybe they're 60% occupied and we'll go lease them up, do renovations and whatnot. But no land. Um, we actually had, we, we actually bought a deal recently. Um, about a year ago that had some excess land that we're looking to, to develop on. Um, what we're trying to do is partner with developers and help and, and be the capital arm for them. Um, cause development is, is just a whole nother animal that they, building out that infrastructure internally doesn't make a lot of sense. So, so yes, because what's about to happen, development makes a lot more sense because I think, you know, the risk of a value add deal versus development are getting close. So, yes. so why not do de and development has more upside. The downside of development, though, is if you're an income driven investor, you know, you're not getting income during construction. Right. So so for one to two years, you know, no yeah. income. That's and that's really why I've stayed away from that is our investor base. They just love cash flow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Well. Okay. Okay. So we do have one question online um, from Betty. 
Uh, she asked, in the past five years, the stock market has gone up. The price of real estate also went up. How is it not correlated? I have one low correlation. Please give example. Um, so the question being, the stock market's gone up and so have real estate values. Um, it's, you know, real estate isn't negatively correlated. So it's, it's you know, 0.2, 0 0.2%. So it, it, it still is, has going up with um, the stock market. Um, so, but now what you're seeing is with interest rates, because real estate so tied to interest rates, you are seeing valuations come down, which is why it is a great buying opportunity. Um, and I think what real estate offers is less volatility, right? Because the stock market is up and down every day, right? I think we're, we're up today and, you know, last week we were down. So real estate is lagging because it's not priced every day, right? So, so you don't have all this volatility that you do in the, in the stock market. So when you say the stock market's up, well, it's up today, but what was it, you know, two weeks ago? Right. So, so I'm, I'm definitely not an, an expert in, in the stock market by any means. Um, I actually got out of the stocks back in, you know, after the 2008 debacle. Um, and so if you look at what's, going on and and if you look at any of the, of the trends historically you would guess that is getting ready to take a nice bite right mm -hmm. uh, for the stocks are going right. to come down right um so do you see the real estate market also coming down um, not necessarily maybe at the same percentage levels that the stock market will mm -hmm. go to but um from a real estate point of view right um i think last year was in houston anyway or in texas was an anomaly uh, in terms of pricing going up and, and mm -hmm. the market the way it was but what's your point of view in terms of real estate now versus potentially what will be happening with the stock market so <clears throat> here's the thing with with real estate there is so much liquidity in the market <laughs> that has what why prices have continuously risen, right? You know, there was a like two years ago when we were bidding on properties, there's 15 offers, right? Now there's five. Um, so it's it's the well-capitalized folks are what's driving up um, interest rates. I mean, uh, um, values. <clears throat> now we'll say, you know, I read the other day about the recession that's coming, that this is one of the first times in our history that we've been bracing for it for six, seven months. I mean, usually like 2008, it just happened. Lehman files bankruptcy and we were in a recession. Whereas now is it, it feels like corporate America is bracing for it. They're doing layoffs. They're being very, um, very diligent about it. So I don't know they, we're definitely going to be in a decline because we've got to get um, um, inflation down. But will it be as bad as I mean, I hear all the I hear it's going to be doom and gloom to we're not even going to have one. Right. So I'm, I'm kind of in the middle. Um, but um, I do think, you know, back to my point of if you're selling real estate, yes, there, there is going to be down like the stock market going down. But if you're but if you're into buying, um, you're going to buy at such a good price that if you do have some vacancy, it's not going to matter as much. Right. So, uh, but real estate is cyclical and, you know, people losing jobs obviously affects office, mostly apartments. Um, you know, we're heavy into industrial and that, that has just performed extremely well. Demand's huge. There hasn't been a ton of light industrial development. So there's a lot of uh, landlocked opportunities. Okay. Any final questions for Ryan today? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. All right. We certainly appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Round of applause for him today. Thank you. I'll take over the clicker. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're just going to go through a few announcements, and then we'll end with deal pitching. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our events, we'll give anyone uh, that would like it the floor to come up here and let us know what it is that you do, what you're looking for. Uh, that way you can network afterwards with those individuals. Uh, I briefly want to mention our Masters of Tax Avoidance Boot Camp. This is coming up at the end of March. It is an in-person event in Houston. Uh, if you're interested, we have a lot of great panels and speakers lined up. Uh, we do have a focus on oil and gas investments, but overall, we're really just focusing on uh, 
uh, alternatives in general. So if you're interested in real estate, oil and gas, new opportunities that are out there in the Houston area, I highly encourage you to attend. Uh, you're welcome to speak with any one of our IRA specialists. We have Nicole and Katie at the back. Uh, if you would like a discount code, we can certainly provide that to you. Um, we have a promotion going on for all of February. If you're looking to open an account, the promotion is that you will be entered into a raffle to uh, have a $500 Airbnb gift card. Um, typically, it's $100 to start the account. Uh, so we can talk through some of the mechanics of our fee schedule and what that account opening and funding process will look like as well. Uh, we encourage you to reach out to us. We have a full team of IRA specialists on staff here. Uh, we also monitor our online chat box. So if you want to go onto the website, ask your questions there, we'd be happy to get in touch with you directly. Um, like I said, we have a full team of IRA specialists on staff here today. So I will be around afterwards. If you'd like to speak, I can pass out a business card and we can get in touch. Um, but other than that, I will go ahead and pass the floor to our first deal pitcher. All right. So good afternoon. Um, obviously, we're trying to stay cold, uh, not cold, but warm and, and dry. But my name is Herman Torres. Um, I'm the uh, founder and uh, managing director of a small private equity firm here in Houston, uh, right here in the Energy Corridor. So we do real estate investments. Um, we also do private lending. We have a portfolio and about, I would say, 65% of our business is private lending. So anyone that's interested in any deals that you may need funding, um, that's what we do, whether it's single family residence, land, if you want to cash out or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> that's one of the things that we do all the time. We also invite you to consider being a co-lender. Uh, that's a way to where you can actually gain a lot of oh, high interest, be fully collateralized with real estate and protect it. Um, so that's something that we are welcome or that we're interested in talking to you about if that's something that um, you may consider. Um, <clears throat> the speaker talked about diversification. That's a key way to do it. And if you have money in, in <clears throat> Quest, <clears throat> we have many people that bring in those funds. Basically, you get paid your interest into your Quest account directly. Uh, so no issues with taxes, uh, any of the regulations that go along those lines. So thank you for your time. Again, Herman Torres with GLNL Holdings. Thank you. Sorry? Oh, I'll give you my card. Thank you. All right. There you are, sir. <laughs> hey, everybody. How are you doing? <clears throat> Was that some good education? Yes. Yeah, very good education. I agree a lot with a lot of things he said. Uh, I'm Steve V. Hill. Uh, we have a lot of companies. We've got the Wealth Club, which is our education company. Uh, we hold a meeting once a month. Uh, it's right here, our education. Uh, we have our networking outside, and then we come in here and do our classroom. Uh, but we're also full-time real estate investors. So, you know, we're always looking for properties, just like everybody else is. <laughs> um, but uh, we've had to diversify over the years, and we've grown a lot. So we do private lending now. We are private lenders. Uh, we put a lot of money to work with a lot of Quest money. Um, we're Quest clients ourselves. We put our money out there working in a lot of uh, different areas. And we've also got a growth fund. So for people that want to be passively invested, we've got a growth fund that you can put money into. Um, it is a Schedule C offering. So it's only for accredited investors. We have to be accredited to uh, qualify to get into the fund. Uh, but more than happy to talk to anybody about that. Um, and our office is right upstairs on the third floor. So you can come visit us anytime. Uh, Well, we, I, we, yeah, we've got all that stuff. Yes, yes. Um, but uh, um, but like I said, you know, for, to, to look at the fund, you know, you'd have to go through the PPM and everything and, and, and look at all that stuff and, and explains everything about the fund. Um, so uh, Steve V. Hill, you know, that's what we do. We're here to help anybody in any way. Um, so uh, give us a call. I got cards in my pocket. So thank you. All right. Any takers? All right. Thank you, ma'am. 
Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Brittany Trebus. Um, I am a realtor here in Houston. Um, I'm also the marketing manager for um, Texas Renters Property Management. Uh, we manage mainly single family homes. We do have a couple like duplexes, um, but mainly single family homes in the Houston area. So if anyone is residential um, real estate investors and need property management to um, help manage your, your renters, we would love to help you. Um, come get me for a card or um, you can shoot me an email at marketing at texasrenters.com. All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Peter McLean. Um, I'm here on behalf of uh, Wealth Assistance. So I heard a little bit about um, diversifying, and maybe I'm a bit left field, but we um, specialize in Amazon e-commerce stores. <clears throat> Spoke a little bit about e-commerce, but that's exactly what we do. We help our clients um, really just uh, invest um, anywhere from about starting uh, at about 50K um, up to you know 200 or so. Um, and we see a return on your investments at about, you know, 15 to 23 uh, percent. And that's month after month. That's passive income. Um, so that's really what I came here to just really let you know. Um, and also that if you do need that at any point, I, div I have some cards if you need. Um, go right ahead. Yeah, I have some cards. And then also you can email me at peter at wealthassistance.com. Um, and anytime that you need any questions, I willing to give a demo or anything that's needed as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. All right. If that is our last um, participant, we're going to go ahead and close out the day. You're welcome to hang around and network a bit. I think there's still some pizza in the kitchen, um, but we want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, we are here. Um, we do this event every month. So if you'd like to join us again, we'll see you next month. Uh, we also have our Tuesday social that's coming up uh, next week. So next Tuesday, same office, uh, but it will be 6.30 to 8.30. So highly encourage you to join us. We have food and drinks for free as well as free education. So can't beat it. We have. It's going to be March 30th. So that's going to be the Masters of Tax Avoidance, March 30th. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Ryan.